shall rise up to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you for your interest in us. And for the grace you give us to always come in your presence to study. To study these words of life. That will lead us to life eternal. Lord, we pray tonight you grant us illumination, inspiration of the Spirit in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, you open our eyes to see, our hearts to understand, our souls to feel the impact of your word, even tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that this will not just be the letter of the word, but Lord, the Spirit. The intention that you had, the purpose, the goal that you had in speaking these words originally, Lord, we pray you make us to see it in Jesus' name. That we will learn and be wiser, learn and be more righteous, learn and get to a closer walk with thee in Jesus' name. And for all our brothers and sisters who are studying with us in all the various satellite locations, Lord, as you are blessing us here, bless them as well in Jesus' name. In the various countries in Africa and beyond, Lord, we pray this word will enrich everyone. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can have your seats and open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be looking at this sermon on the mount. The very message of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave to his disciples. And he gave it to the multitudes as well. And today, as Christ remains the same, his word remains the same. And if Jesus Christ were to be here today in the physical and the natural, he'll still be teaching us the same thing because he says it changes not Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And the spirit of his father that puts the word in him and made him to open his mouth and say to the people these are the words of the father and he said these are not my words but the words of him that sent me that same god that same father remains the same he says i am god i change not we're looking at the words of the unchanging god and the words of the unchanging Christ. And these are the unchanging words and the message he has for the church today. And what he spoke to them is speaking to every one of us. He says, what I tell others, I tell you. I tell everyone. You remember he said the conclusion of his message to his seven churches of Asia Minor. Every time he closed the message, he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. That means he spoke to the local church, a particular church, a specified church that he named. And then at the end of the message he said, this is not just for this church. What I say to this church, I say to everyone. Therefore he says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches the same thing we can say about the message we're looking at about the sermon on the mount that the lord spoke to that primary initial congregation but then through them he caused everything to breach in down so that you and i will be able to have the same privilege of studying the same word and we're saying the same thing that jesus said to all those churches at the end of the messages of all those churches he that has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And you will see something that Jesus Christ has been emphasizing. He has been telling us the principles of the kingdom. He is the king of the kingdom. And then he said the kingdom of God is certain. Repent ye and believe so you can enter into that kingdom. Now when you enter into the kingdom, you need the principles of life. That's why he gave the message. Here is the king. Revealing the principles of the kingdom unto us. And he says, if you are a citizen of the kingdom, this is how to live. Now the people that listen to him, they were in a transition. When we say transition, it means they were moving from one level to the other. One state to the other, one kingdom to the other. They were in the old covenant. And the end of the old covenant was already coming. 
and the beginning of the new covenant was taking place and as they were in transition from the old covenant to the new covenant he had to tell them now this is what you believed and what you did in the old covenant here is the new covenant and this is how you are to live that's why he said it was said by them of all time old covenant now there's a transition you're moving on to the new but i say unto you you will not keep on looking back unto the old covenant you'll come to the new covenant and live in the principles of the new covenant let's come now to matthew chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 33 again just that word again which means he had been saying some things he's still following the same pattern and he began that pattern in verse 21. Uh, first of all, he laid down uh, the foundation, the pillars. Blessed, he said, at the, at the poor in spirit. That's a pillar, that's a foundation. And then he said, blessed are they that mourn. They mourn for their sins. That's a pillar, that's a foundation. And then he said, blessed are the meek. Another pillar. And then he says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then blessed are the merciful. And blessed are the the pure in heart and blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake after laying all those foundation stones like the cornerstone of a building like the pillars of a building like a foundation of an edifice now he wants to tell us some practical things building upon those foundations and it started in verse 21 ye have heard that it was said by them of all time it referred to the old covenant and even to the misconception misunderstanding misinterpretation of the teachers of the old covenant and then it says but leave that alone leave the old and come to the new leave the other kingdom and come to this kingdom make a transition and come right into the new you have heard it was said by them of all time thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment but i say unto you close your eyes to the old open your eyes to the new and then he tells us in verse 27 you have heard it was said by them of all time again he went back to the old covenant and then now he comes to the new covenant and he says in verse 28 but i say unto thee then you look at verse 31 it has been said that's the old then in verse 32 but i say unto you it comes to the new it's telling us number one is making a contrast between the old and the new and it's telling you that the old is incomplete without the new and the new is actually the conclusion the climax and the completeness of the mind of god and the will of god that's why after he had said you know the old now you know the new you know the old now this is the new you've heard of the old days is now the new that's why it now comes to verse 33 and it says again you have heard it had been said by them of old time again the old covenant and uh, you understand then and uh, there are some things that were allowed in the old covenant that are no more allowed in this new covenant there were some practices that they accepted tolerated permitted in the old covenant in the old kingdom that are no more tolerated and permitted allowed in this new covenant in the new kingdom there were some things allowed under moses and the prophets and the judges and the kings and the whole of the old testament from genesis to malachi there were some things that were allowed and permitted tolerated there that are no more allowed in the kingdom of christ and that's why it will be wrong of anyone in the new covenant to point any to anything in the old covenant to justify his way of life to say after all this is how they did it and he can quote a verse and can show us a story an example in the old covenant and say after all this is how they did it at that time the lord says no 
this is new and if any man be in Christ a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things have become new it brings us to the new covenant and it says the principles of the new covenant of the new kingdom they're very much different from the practices and the pattern of the old covenant and in the case of what we're looking at today this thing was very common in the old you'll find it from Genesis to Malachi but now as you open the pages of Matthew and the king appears and Jesus Christ our Lord our Christ our Savior appears he says this is what you will find on the pages of the old covenant but now I say to you there is a change let's look at it Matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 33 again ye have heard that have been said by them of all time thou shalt not forswear thyself but shall perform that unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Swear not at all. But Abraham swore, that's all covenant, telling you, swear not at all. But Jacob and Esau, they, uh, they finalize the selling of the birthright by swearing. I'm telling you, swear not at all. But Abimelech swore to Abraham and Isaac. But I'm telling you, this is new covenant, swear not at all. I think I read in the Bible, David swore to Saul that when he now takes over the kingdom, he will remember him and will not wipe him out. Yes, that's all covenant. I'm telling you, swear not at all. I think that Almighty God himself, you must swore to Abraham in the old covenant and he confirmed the, what he said, the promised man oath. That's the old covenant. But the Lord is saying, but I say unto you, swear not at all. And you see, when you go to the old covenant, there are a lot of things to discover there. Because they were at the preliminary stage, at the primary level, at the kindergarten. And the grace of God was not over surplus and abundant for them. But now you come to the new covenant and then everything has changed. And the Lord is saying, but I say unto you, swear not at all. Now he began now to relate and to identify the things they were swearing by. Look at verse 34. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Neither by heaven for it is God's throne not by the earth for it is his footstool neither by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king neither shall thou swear by thy head because thou canst not make one air white or black but let your communication let your conversation let your interaction let your speech let your communing with one another, let your communication be yea, yea. That means yes, yes. Nay, nay. That means no, no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. The Lord is telling us about the principle and the practice of truthfulness. 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 That we need to be truthful. In our day-to-day -day interaction, relationship, fellowship with one another, just be truthful. No lying, no deception, no hypocrisy, nothing shaded, nothing exaggerated, just the truth, the absolute truth as we relate with one another. As we look at the people of the Old Testament, false swearing was forbidden in the Old Testament. But every kind of swearing is now forbidden by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions several forms of that swearing and oath taking, and he forbids them all. Then he prescribes the simple forms of affirmation or denial. Affirmation, yes, yes, yea, yeah, yea. Yeah. Or denial, no, no, or nay, nay, as all that his followers should employ in normal, in normal conversation or even in legal transaction. Every form of oath or swearing, however solemn or true, is forbidden to a true believer in Christ. If you go to uh, get maybe a video wait for your for your birth certificate. You cannot swear anymore. You just affirm your word. 
Or if you maybe you're in a community and they say, as they, this thing has been lost. Do you know about it? No, I don't know about it. No, no, that's all you say. I, they say, okay, come and swear. Say, no, I'm a Christian. And you take me for my word. Followers of Christ, don't swear. Somebody is making an agreement with you and he's saying, Now promise me, this is what you are going to do. And then you promise him. He says, Now here is a Bible. Let us swear that you will not deceive me, you will not disappoint me. No, I don't swear. Take me for my word. Christians don't swear, whether in normal conversation, normal transaction, business transaction. Or legal matters, we don't swear, we just affirm our words. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, whether it's a court of law or out of a court of law, Christ commands, we're not at all. All swearing is set aside by all who submit to Christ as a final authority in their lives. A simple word of affirmation, yes, yes. Or a simple word of denial, no, no. Calmly repeated is a sufficient bunch of truths. A truly righteous man, he will speak the truth without an oath. That's what is meant to be righteous. If you're truly righteous, and you really know the Lord You don't need to swear before you tell the truth We expect that you are going to tell the truth If you are a child of God If Christ the truth abides in you And if you abide in him Who is the truth The truth in you and you in the truth You are going to speak the truth Christians should not yield to the evil custom of swearing you hear that kind of swearing almost everywhere In the bus, in the taxi, on the street, at the bus stop, in the office In many, many places Some people, it's their habit to just swear And they say something very simple Then they call the name of the Almighty God They don't understand Because the Lord has now said In this new dispensation, swear not at all Whatever great, the, however great the pressure may be put upon you, you should abide by the plain unmistakable command of the Lord that says, swear not at all. We're dividing the study tonight to three parts. Number one, the common practice of swearing before Christ came in the old covenant. From Genesis to Malachi. Before Christ came, the old common practice of swearing. Number two, Christ's prohibition of swearing for Christians. Christ's prohibition of swearing for Christians. Number three, Christian pattern of speech and communication. The Christian pattern of speech and communication. We come to number one. The common practice of swearing before Christ came. In Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 33. Again, ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. That word forswear means to swear falsely. So if you read that place again Thou shalt not forswear thyself What it means is Thou shalt not swear falsely And then it says But thou shalt perform unto the Lord Thine oaths That was the understanding The old covenant That was the ideology The idea, the practice In the old testament And let's look at it from the time of Abraham In Genesis chapter 21 And see what they did Genesis chapter 21, reading from verse 22. And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his soul, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Isn't it wonderful that those heathen people, pagan people, unbelieving people, sinful people, they could see? The glory of God, the blessing of God, the presence of God, the favor of God upon the life of his man, of his friend, Abraham. And he noted and he said, God is with thee in all that thou doest. Verse 23, now therefore swear unto me, swear unto me here by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. 
but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. That's Abraham. Now for a New Testament believer to say, I read that Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham was a friend of God. And if Abraham did that, then we can do that today. No, we cannot do that today. Because it was permitted for them of the old generation of the old covenant that they could swear but jesus said but i say unto you thou shalt not swear abraham did it that's not an excuse can we extend that a little bit there are many things you'll find that the old testament people did old covenant people did and then many times people want to justify their action by a particular example a particular story a particular situation in the old covenant and they say well abraham was a friend of god wasn't he oh yes he was but a friend in the old covenant you are now a child of god in the new covenant that's very different and because you need, you live in a different dispensation, a different time, a different era, a different covenant. Because of that, you cannot bring yourself back and say, because they did it in the old covenant, I'm going to do it now. No, you cannot. Especially, you see this now, Jesus said, it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not forswear thyself. And, but I shall perform your oath unto the Lord. But I say unto you, swear not at all. It tells us we must not swear. Although they did it at that time, it is no more permissible today. Genesis chapter 24. In Genesis chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 1. Genesis chapter 24, reading from verse 1. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto the unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my tie, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, unto the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my country, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. You see the situation here. Abraham wanted to have a wife for his son. And he didn't want his son to be unequally yoked together with the unbelievers, or the pagans, or the heathens, all around. And therefore he said, now the elders of my servant, you have a responsibility here. Remember, they didn't even have the whole Bible. Remember, Abraham did not even have Genesis. It was Moses that wrote Genesis much, much, much after Abraham had died. And so, but, but the little light he had, the little revelation he had, he knew that his son Isaac will not marry among the heathen. And so he said, now you come and put your hand under my tie. And then you'll go and look for a wife for my, for my son. But you are going to swear unto me that you are not going to marry from the heathen, from the pagans, from the unbelievers, from the sinners. And how wonderful today that if Abraham knew that long ago that Isaac, the seed and the son of promise, must not marry an unbeliever. How much more true it is today that we were the children of God. That we too we will not allow our own children who claim to be believers to marry unbelievers, to marry sinners, to marry pagans. To marry heathens but he'll marry according to the will of god he'll marry children of god and then we're told in verse 9 and the servant put his hand under the tie of abraham his master and swear to him concerning that matter uh, you see the practice of swearing then at that time when a case was very serious and very solemn 
and they needed a word that you will not go beyond this point you will not contradict this agreement you will not break this agreement we are getting into they will seal everything up by an oath and uh, but now we are told yes we tell the truth yes we still get into agreements but we will not swear as they did at that time and let's look at Joshua chapter 2 in Joshua chapter 2 here we go beyond the time of Abraham even beyond the time of Moses we come now to the time of the children of Israel as they were preparing to enter into the land of Canaan in Joshua chapter 2 Joshua chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that he will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a short token, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death and the men answered her our life for yours if ye utter not this our business and it shall be when the lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee that's the situation with rahab rahab had received those two spies and, and she knew she confessed it she proclaimed it we know that the lord has given you the land and that everybody is trembling and we're fearful because of you now she said but i'm throwing my lord to the people of god i will not be among the heathens the pagans the people at jericho and the canaanites that will fight against the plan of the lord and the will of the lord i will not fight against god's plan but you are going to give me a true token that when you come in and you take the land and you conquer Jericho and you conquer the land of Canaan, you are going to swear unto me that you are going to preserve me alive. And he swore to him, they said, this is the condition. If you will not reveal this, our business, that's the condition. And then we give our word, we give a promise under oath that we're going to save your life and we're going to preserve your life. That was a common practice in the old covenant, Je Jeremiah chapter 38. It was not just among common people, it was also among great people, Abraham and the kings and the chiefs of the land. Then Rahab and the representatives of Joshua. And then you'll find that everywhere in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, the swearing was permitted, was allowed, was tolerated. But now Jesus said, I say unto you, it's no more permitted. You cannot say now, they did it before, I can do it now. No, you cannot if you're a true believer. Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 16. So said the king, swear secretly unto Jeremiah. Swear, swear. The king, Zedekiah, swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, as the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. Can you see that? That was swearing. Now, from a king unto a prophet. But I need to tell you something. As time went on, the swearing became useless. Because they were not truthful anymore. Because they knew that the other fellow once we say we swear by such and such in heaven on earth, we swear by the head, we swear by Jerusalem, we swear by this or that. They knew that the other fellow will just take them at their word. So they began now to tell lies and to deceive, and then they will now cap it up, seal it with an oath. We're swearing. It became something useless, not dependable anymore. And look at Isaiah chapter 48 and see how everything degenerated into just um, carnal, foolish, sinful, deceptive, a kind of swearing. In Isaiah chapter 48, reading from verse 1. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, and I come forth out of the waters of Judah. 
that which swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth and nor in righteousness. Yes, they were swearing, but it was no more in truth. And it was no more in righteousness. For they called themselves of the holy city and they stayed themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them I did them suddenly and they came to pass because I knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew and thy brow brass you see they got into deception and lying and then they will seal their lie with an oath we're swearing and god said this sin is, is, is of no use anymore because you see the earlier days in the time of genesis and the time of numbers and the time of joshua the people they feared the name of the lord and if they swore at all in the name of the Lord, they were so much fearful, they will keep to it because the name of the Lord was involved. But later, those people of uh, the people of Israel, they cared not for anything at all. Lying became second nature to them. And when he told the lie, they'll just seal it with an oath. And God said, These are obstinate people stiff-necked people they called the name of the lord to witness there was something that wasn't true at all in jeremiah chapter 7 jeremiah chapter 7 reading from verse 8 in jeremiah chapter 7 reading from verse 8 it says behold ye trust in lying words that cannot profit Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after all the gods whom ye know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? These people, they were still pretending to worship God. And they will come to uh, the sanctuary, to the tabernacle. They will come to the temple of God. And then they will say, God is protecting us. If God wasn't happy with us, why will he be protecting us? See, he is protecting us. Yes, they were lying. They were swearing falsely. And they were claiming that they were stealing the Lord. Like many, many people today, nominal Christians, bench warmers, church goers, they are not living right. And they say, but God is providing for me. God is blessing my business. And God is, you know, blessing me every way. If God wasn't happy with me, why will he be? blessing me this way that's what they were saying they were swearing falsely they were not living right and they were kind of sealing their error and their deception and their lying their hypocrisy by swearing and yet they'll come to the house of god and in verse 10 and come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations in verse 11 is this house which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I have even seen it, says the Lord. It tells us in verse 15, and I will cast you out of my sight. As I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. False swearing became something very common in the midst. Zephaniah chapter 1. In Zephaniah chapter 1, here we see once again how false swearing have become so common, so rampant in the midst of the children of Israel. Zephaniah chapter 1, reading from verse 2. I will utterly consume all things from off the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. And will co I will consume the fowls of heaven and the fishes of the sea the stumbling blocks with the wicked and i will cut off the man man from off the land says the lord and i will stretch i will also stretch out my hand upon judah and upon the inhabitants of jerusalem and i will cut off the remnant of baal from this place and the name of shemarim's 
of the priests and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops and them that worship and them that swear by the Lord and that swear by Malcolm. On the one hand, they'll swear by the name of the Lord and then the very next moment, they'll swear by the name of an idol. And then God said, I'll cut them off. I'll cut them off as I will cut all liars off. All deceivers, he'll cut them off. Because God hates lying. And God hates deception. And he told those people of the old covenant, he said, You're no more truthful. You're false. And then you seal your lie and your deception. You seal it with an oath. We're swearing. I'm going to cut off all those people. It says in verse 6, and them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired from him. Zechariah chapter 5. In Zechariah chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 3. Zechariah chapter 5, reading from verse 3. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off on, as on this side according to each. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on, on that side according to it. Do you see that the thieves are in the same camp, in the same group, under the same condemnation and judgment as those that swear falsely. And the Lord said, those who steal, I'm cutting them off. I'll punish them. I'll debar them from coming to my side. I will keep them away forever from my presence. As I'm in heaven, they will not be in heaven, they will be in hell. Those who steal. And they die in that condition. But then he says, those who swear falsely, they'll be in the same camp, in the same group, under the same condemnation, under the same punishment. And why don't you correct all those lies you have told? You know, sometimes when you have told a lie, and you think, well, if I go to correct it, how about the shame? Think about the shame before just one person. Or the shame even before a large congregation. The shame of one week, the shame of one month, the shame of one year. Compare that with the punishment in hellfire for one year, ten years, a hundred years, thousand years, a million years. It's better to face the shame today. It's better to face the difficulty today, the challenge today. And say, I'll face it. You told a lie. You deceived. Maybe you deceived members of your family. Face it. Maybe you deceived the government. Face it. Maybe you deceived your employers. Face it now. Because if you don't, the Lord is saying, in the same camp, in the same group, in the same condemnation, under the same punishment, will be the thieves and those that swear falsely and those that confirm their lies and their, and their deception, their hypocrisy. They confirm each with an oath. They're going to suffer the same eternal punishment. Zechariah chapter 5, look at verse 4. And I will bring it forth, says the Lord of hosts. And it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof, and with the stones thereof. Any remedy? Yes. What can you do to remedy the situation? We're told in Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. This is the remedy. While you're opening your Bible, you repent of your lies. You repent of your sin. You repent of your deception. You repent of your hypocrisy. You repent of the false swearing. And then, after the repentance, you make restitution. Repentance plus restitution will win you the favor of God. You say, I'm sorry, what I told you the other time, it wasn't the absolute truth. And I knew it when I was saying it. I'm sorry about that. 
I yielded to the temptation of the devil and there's nothing to actually gain. I gained nothing out of it except the shame and the guilt and the, and the guilty conscience. As you repent of that lie and you make restitution and you pray to, to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry about that. Cleanse me, wash me, cover all those things away from your sight. And then you'll have the mercy of God because the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember the Bible says he that covereth the sin shall not prosper. That is you have told a lie. You have deceived. You have sworn falsely and then you cover each up because of what they will say. How can somebody like me, how can I go before so and so, my employer, and then tell them, actually, uh, I told a lie. It wasn't right. Then look at what the consequence might be. They might say, uh, and you say you're a Christian? That's, I'm sorry. How could you do that? I'm sorry. But you've been going to church. I am sorry. And you'll be pretending as if you're the cleanest and the holiest man here. I am sorry. Whatever they say, I am sorry. They won't kill you. And then you have a clear conscience. You have a clean conscience. You have a purged conscience. Then you go out of that place with a free mind. Because now you've settled the account. Leviticus chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, If a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie unto his neighbor and lie and lie and deceive his neighbor in that which was delivered into him or in fellowship or in a sin taken, uh, taken away by violence and has deceived his neighbor and has deceived his neighbor have you deceived your neighbor have you deceived your landlord? Have you deceived your co-tenant? Have you deceived a colleague? Have you deceived somebody very close, very near to you? And he has deceived his neighbor. Or he has found that which was lost in verse 3. On, and lieth concerning age. And sweareth falsely. And sweareth falsely. And sweareth falsely. You know, sometimes there are people that have stolen something. Maybe in the church. Maybe in the hostel. Maybe in the school. Maybe in the accommodation in the place you are living. They have stolen something. Maybe in your place of work. And now everybody is looking for it. And this man is also serious. Deadly serious. Looking for what he stole. And then you'll be saying, how can people be so bad like this? That as they're taking care of us in this, our church, as they're taking care of us in this, our place of work, how can somebody be so wicked and so cruel and do something like this? And the way he's talking, you'll think he's innocent and he's a sea. And he's even saying, I wish they should catch this person that stole this thing. This fellow should be punished. This ungrateful man or woman, whoever that person is, this a fellow wicked, fellow sinful, fellow backslider, who can do something like this? I wish they discovered this person punished and is the one that did it. And the way he's talking so forcefully and so fiercely, you'll think he's an innocent man. And he begins to curse. And he begins to swear. And he begins to say, the person that has done this, and the way he's swearing, you'll say, this one is innocent. You say, this one, come on here. You are my partner. Let us look for who has stolen it. But the man, the woman is swearing falsely. And the Lord says, there's condemnation, there's punishment on such an individual. If you're going to come out of that punishment, out of that condemnation, there'll be repentance, there'll be restitution. Look at that verse 4. It shall be because he has sinned and is guilty that he shall restore that which he took violently away and the sin which he has deceitfully gotten or that was delivered unto him to keep and lost the lost sin that he found. All that about which he has sworn falsely. 
everything that he swore falsely about. He shall even restore it in the principal and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. That's how he's going to be forgiven. That's why he's going to have the favor of God. That's how he's going to be able to have the forgiveness and the peace of God once again. And the salvation of the Lord once again. And the Lord hates lying. Whether in the old covenant or in the new covenant, he hates deception. It's an abomination unto the Lord. Hey, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven, an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue. He hates it. And if you're doing something that God hates, if you die in that condition, without repentance, without restitution, there will be no mercy. He says he hates it. A lying tongue. And then in verse, in verse 19, a false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. He that soweth discord among the brethren, God hates it. It's an abomination unto the Lord. We're told in um, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 11 he wants us who are following Christ who are following the Lord who believe in the Lord to deal only in the truth never in lying Leviticus chapter 19 verse 11 ye shall not steal neither deal falsely neither lie one to another lie, neither lie one to another neither lie one to another Aaron, you will not lie to Moses. Joshua, you will not lie to Moses. Eliezer, you will not lie to Aaron. Caleb, you will not lie to your friend Joshua. Levi's, you will not lie to the priest. Neither lie one to another. The Lord doesn't want to touch you deal in lying at all. You come to the New Testament in Colossians chapter 3 verse 9. Colossians chapter 3. We're looking at verse 9. Lie not one to another seeing that ye are put off the old man with his deeds. Lie not one to another. Why will you lie? Because of the fear of man. What will you like? Because of the preservation of self-respect. Which one is greater, self-respect or your salvation? If you lie, you lose that grace and you lose that fellowship with the Lord. But then you might keep your self-respect. What's the use of self-respect if there's no salvation? If there's no eternal life? If there is no free conscience? And if there is no ticket to get to heaven, what's the use of what's the use of self-respect or self-esteem? I need to keep my self-respect. If they knew that I was the one that did that sin, uh, they're not they're going to look down on me. Rather than allow them to look down, you and keep your clean conscience and keep your salvation and keep your relationship and fellowship with the Lord. What do you want to do with self-respect if you don't go to heaven? And the people that go to hell with self-respect what does that matter to them the thing that matters is our relationship with the lord our salvation righteousness that keeps us in the bosom of the lord lying not one to another seeing that he have put up the old man with his deeds we're told in revelation chapter 21 revelation chapter 21 i'm reading from verse 8 Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, and the all mongers and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, all liars, shall have their part in the lake which born with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Lying will get you to hell. Whether you swear to it or not, lying, lying without swearing, lying without swearing, the same thing will get you to hell. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, 
And I shall in no wise enter into it, that is, into the new Jerusalem, any sin that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, manufacturing a lie, developing a lie, and then producing a lie. Neither shall any of those people that make lying, that make a lie, neither will they enter into it, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. For without outside the gates of heaven, for without are the dogs and sorcerers and all mongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. We go to point number two. Christ's prohibition of swearing for Christians. Christ's prohibition of swearing for Christians. In Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, we come to verse 34. Here the Lord Jesus Christ now wants to lay down the principle of the kingdom of God, the principle for citizens of the kingdom, how they are to live. The life where to live. Here is, here is it. It says, but I say unto you, what a great authority. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. It says, swear not at all. And it tells us now, all the various items and the various things we mustn't use, must not come out of our mouth, thinking that we're swearing to the truth. That I said this, and then you say, heaven is my witness. I said, never. I say this, and I swear by Jerusalem that this is the absolute truth. I said, never. I said this, and for you to know it is the truth, I swear by my head. If it is not the truth, let something happen to my head. The Lord said, never. It says, but I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, because it is God's throne. In verse 35, neither by the earth, for it is his foot too. Then it says, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. It goes on in verse 36, and it says, neither shall thou swear by thy head. Because thou canst not make one ear white or black. You will see then that Christ, the highest authority in all points of Christian doctrine and Christian practice. He tells us what the Christian doctrine is. What's the doctrine? What's the teaching? What's the principle? Swear not at all. That is in your family, in your home. Between husband and wife. Between parents and children. Between landlord and the co and the tenants, between the tenants together, co-tenants together, swear not at all. Between the principal and the students, between the teacher and the principal, and between the learners and those who are learned, it says swear not at all. In your community and in your in your in your office, it says swear not at all. Maybe the manager calls you. Hey, there is somebody is putting something here every time. And before we come to the office, something is uh, you know putting the shackle here. And everybody, all you workers, I know you don't like me. Somebody wants to do me harm. Okay, everybody now, if you're not the one, you will swear. And then it says line up today before we start work. Everybody will swear. And then you say, uh, please, uh, uh, director, I'm a Christian. You, I cannot do anything like that. Take my word for it. I'm innocent of this. I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't know today, I'm not going to take Christian or no Christian, church goer, no church goer. Everybody must swear. You say, I will not. If you don't swear, then it is you that is uh, pouring, this down, pouring this thing down here. You say, no, my word is my bond. And you're not allowed the pressure or the threat or the things they will say. You're not allowed that to push you into swearing because Jesus said, swear not at all. That's the Christian doctrine. That's the Christian precept. That's the Christian practice. Christ, as the authoritative teacher, 
Christ as the final Lord and Savior. He commands God's people in these present dispensations when not at all. And then we should faithfully and unhesitatingly take him at his word, not using the oath or swearing under any circumstances. Instead of taking an oath or swearing in a court of law, even when you go to a court of law because you need uh, the Abida wait for your birth certificate or maybe another thing, or you want to sign a particular document, and you say, Well, this document, before it will come out, you must hold on to the Bible and then raise up the other hand and say, I swear by. You say, No, I will not swear. I will affirm my word. Christians don't swear. But rather, you affirm the truth of what you say. Instead of saying, I do hereby solemnly swear, you will say, I do affirm that. Then you affirm what you want to affirm. There is an essential difference between an oath and affirmation. When we take an affirmation, we simply state that we mean to tell the truth so far as we understand it. Knowing that if we violate this promise of telling the truth will be held under the same penalties as if we had violated an oath. That is, if we told a lie just because we are not swearing, we we'll see under judgment. Let us note that while we are definitely commanded to not to swear at all, the inspired writer does not hesitate to say, I will affirm, I will affirm. And let's look at Titus chapter 3 verse 8. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. I will that thou affirm. In uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 8, here is what it says. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Yes, we can affirm. You speak the word of truth. And then you say, here it is. I affirm that what I have said is the truth that then is to guide us in all the things we do in all the things we say james chapter 5 i'm reading verse 12 in james chapter 5 we're looking at verse 12 but above all things my brethren swear not out of the mouths of two or three witnesses the truth shall be affirmed and confirmed the lord jesus christ said swear not at all here we read in the epistle of james it says but above all things my brethren swear not neither by heaven neither by the earth neither by any other oath but let your yea be yea let your yes be yes and let your nay be nay let your no be no lest ye fall into condemnation we come to point number three in point number three we're looking at the christian pattern of speech and communication the christian pattern of speech and communication we're looking at matthew chapter 5 reading verse 37 matthew chapter 5 verse 37 here is the watch of the lord what the lord is telling us in our communication in our interaction in our transaction in our day-to-day -day living relationship and fellowship with one another matthew chapter 5 verse 37 but let your communication be yea yea nay nay for whatsoever is more than these comes of evil let your communication be yes yes or no no isn't that exactly what we read just a few minutes ago in james let's look at that again james chapter 5 verse 12 james chapter 5 verse 12 but above all things my brethren this is talking to the believers my brethren these are the people that take Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. My brethren, these are the people that have come out of the old covenant. And have come into the new covenant. These are the people that know that the old is gone. And the new has now come. These are the people that are guided and ruled and controlled. 
and influenced by the word of the Lord because they have taken Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then he tells us then, if you are one of the brethren, if you are a child of God, if you have become a child of God by faith in Christ, and now you have pledged your life, consecrated your life living according to the principles of the kingdom of god it says above all things my brethren swear not swear not you go to see the marriage committee and they say this story you are telling us can we believe this story and then you raise up your hand and begin to swear swear not you are in a business deal with a partner, a business partner, and you say this is all the gain that we have. We're going to divide it now. We agreed before we're going to be dividing 50 50. And uh, so, and the other fellow said, Is this everything? And then you begin to raise up your Bible. Let me swear. Swear not. Or maybe it is that your husband traveled, and your husband just came back, and uh, your husband uh, said, Since I left and since I went, I hope everything has, and you kept yourself. Uh, if you want me to swear, I'll swear. Swear not. Here the Lord is telling us, He's telling us in this epistle that in whatever situation we find ourselves, and in whatever transaction it may be, legal transaction or normal transaction, it says, We're not, neither by heaven, nor by the earth. No, by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and let your nay be nay. Be a truthful person, be a dependable person, a loyal, faithful, trustworthy person. So that you keep the dignity of the Christian life, and you let your yes be yes, and you let your no be no. That if you say no, it's not true. They can go and investigate. They'll come back and say, yes, you are right. It's not true. And if you said, this is it. They may bring all the people that have studied all the science of detectives. To investigate and to examine and to find out. And they're going to find out that what you said is the real truth because you are a Christian. Let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Say everything, every little thing, every minute thing. Let him be the truthful thing. That's the evidence that you're a Christian, that you're a child of God. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest he fall into condemnation. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. There are some people that say that they love and they pretend to tell and they pretend to love and therefore they tell a lie. They say, if I told that man the truth, the truth will make him sad. If I told him the real truth about it, it will, it will make him to really be unhappy. And you know my goal, I don't want him to be unhappy. I want him to be happy joyful glad and lord you know my intention you know my heart i just want to make the person happy and if i told him the truth he will not be happy so i'm going to tell him a lie because i love him the bible says no speaking the truth in love if you love a person you'll tell him the truth you'll tell him the truth you know sometimes you have to tell something and you have to tell somebody something that is painful but you still tell him. I, I sometimes use the, I use the illustration of a doctor. The doctor has discovered that this man has a serious case. And he needs to know about it. It will jolt him. It will make him unhappy. It, it might even make him cry. But this is the truth. And if the doctor did not tell the man the truth, the doctor will not be showing love. The doctor says, well, I love this fellow. I want him to be happy. He has a deadly disease. But I want to tell him that, you know, you are doing all right. You are doing okay. Looks like, how can you be this healthy at this age? If I was healthy as you are, I'll be jumping for joy. And it's a lie. You want to kill the man. Tell him the truth in love. However, he will feel, even if he will cry. Even if he will say, you, my brother, you are telling me something like this. So 
so this kind of thing happened how could you do this i'm sorrowful i'm sad i'm disappointed i'm battered i'm shattered shatter him and just kneel and say i'm sorry i'm sorry but this is the truth and i need to tell you this truth because i love you we tell the truth in every situation it says speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even christ verse 25 put, wherefore putting away lying speak every man every man every man speak every man the truth truth with his neighbor for we are members of one another members of one another on the one hand husbands and wives are members of one another can you imagine when it says the two shall be one and can you imagine the husband ever telling a lie however slight however minor however superficial can you imagine a husband telling a lie to the wife when members one with another even if you have to, you know, say, you know, my wife, I want to tell you something. And I hope you are ready for this. And you know, if it were not my commitment, being a part of you and you are part of me, I shouldn't be saying something like this. But I have to say it. This is the truth. It will make us weep together. It will make us cry together. It will make us search together. It will make us pray together. It will make us go on our knees together. But I will tell you, this is the truth. That's Christianity. Oh, I don't want to talk to her because of her condition. What condition? It's the truth that will heal her. It's the truth. That will set her free. Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. We don't preserve people by lying. We don't preserve relationship by lying. I want to preserve my relationship with him. I want to preserve my friendship with him. I want to preserve our agreement together. And because I want to preserve our good relationship. I must preserve it by lying. Never. The Lord will not be in it if you're lying But it's when you tell the truth to one another And then the wife, uh, you know, uh, says My husband, I have something to tell you Tell me now No, I want you, so we have to see now and say this one And, uh, well, I don't know how you're going to feel about this But I have to tell you I don't want to keep something in my heart That you don't know about I want you to know everything Everything about my life Here is it Is the truth But you know covering up this lie And patching it here And patching it there And thinking that we're preserving A relationship, a fellowship There's no fellowship there if I'm deceiving you, I'm not in fellowship with you. If you are deceiving me, you are not in fellowship with me. Smiling is not fellowship. Saying, God bless you, that's not fellowship. Saying, thank you, sir, that's not fellowship. Fellowship is truth, truthfulness. When I tell you the truth, when it is painful, you say, hey, this fellow, it looks like you know, it's a sincere person. Even when he knows that the truth is telling It's going to pinch me Or it's going to be painful to me He still tells the truth Tell the truth to one another That's why it says in verse 25 Wherefore putting away lying Speak every man Truth with his neighbor For we are members One of another And then he tells us in verse 29 Let no corrupt communication Proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We're looking at Psalm 15, reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, reading from verse 1. And what a serious solemn psalm is this. Psalm 15, reading from verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in the tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? There comes a time in the life of a man. When with all the money he has. With all the position he occupies. With the grandeur, the majesty of the throne he sits upon. 
with all the train of servants serving him and whirling all around him there comes a time in the life of a man when he thinks about the future when all this is over when the throne on earth will eject me and they put me in the grave when all the money and all the position when it will matter not on that final day when man is going to his final eternal home on that final day when the the loveliest of my servants will not be able to follow me to where i'm going there comes a time in the life of a man when he begins to think where will i spend eternity what will happen on that final day when the bell will ring what will happen when everything in the house everything around the throne everything in the palace is dead silent and then people are mourning and people are crying and people are sobbing and they're saying papa is gone mama is gone on that final day when everybody goes softly and then you can tell something has happened he is gone there comes a time in the life of a man he begins to think about where he'll spend eternity that happened to david that's why he began to ask the question he said lord who shall abide in the tabernacle who shall dwell in the holy hill and the answer came to him david what are you going to do of the answer because you know sometimes the business and the duty of the throne can take heaven away from you you may be so busy you're not even thinking about your eternity you may be so busy that even though you have the answer this is what it takes to get into that final place the place of god in heaven you may be so busy that you'll say i think about that later and then death knocks at the door you don't have any time to think about it and so david when you have the answer as to what it takes to get to heaven what are you going to do about it lord who shall abide in thy tabernacle or who shall dwell in thy holy hill here comes the answer he that walketh uprightly what are you going to do with that he that walketh uprightly now this answer is coming to you it's coming to me you know there comes a time when preaching will stop there comes a time when there is no pastoring anymore there comes a time when there's no ministration anymore there comes a time when crusades will come to an end that the man cannot jump here and jump there and everything comes to a standstill there comes a time when you have to prepare to leave this place moses was here is no more here he has gone joshua was here is no more here is gone and david was here is no more here is gone paul was here is no more here is gone there comes a time in the life of a man or a woman when he needs to stop everything and then he says bye bye or maybe if, even if he doesn't have the time to say bye bye the world will say bye bye to him and then he's gone at that time where will you spend eternity that's why you need to consider the question lord who shall abide in the tabernacle who shall dwell in the holy hill he that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh and speaketh the truth in his heart the truth is in the heart he knows the truth he doesn't hide it in the heart and speak another thing that's what it takes to get to heaven and the reason we came here young and old men and women to the bible study and the reason you are there my brother my sister in the satellite location and you put aside every other thing and say i'm going to the bible study you want to make this place you want to make that place the gate of heaven and should the trumpet sound anytime who will be there as the saints go marching in sinners will not be among them who will be there the people that speak the truth in their hearts here comes ananias and then he brought some money with him and here is peter sitting down who knows the last event before we leave this place who knows the last action before we leave and then he brought the money and peter said ananias is this everything oh and i said yes 
speaking the truth in your heart. Ananias, how has Satan filled your heart to lie? You have lied unto the Holy Ghost. Whilst it remained, was it not yours? Who is forcing you? You didn't have to come. You didn't even have to put anything down. Why the lie? And before that man had a chance to repent, he fell down and he died. He died a liar. In the early church, with all the miracles surrounding them, died in the early church, in Jerusalem, headquarters church. And then they went to bury him. No form of fear. They didn't even develop any program. I'm sure they didn't bring any choir to sing. I'm sure they didn't bring any, any person to officiate. The wife did not even know. And the wife came. Wanting to buy the apostles' favor with lie. And then Peter said, Sapphira, tell me. Was it so much you sold the land? Tell the truth in your heart. What will they do if you tell the truth? They'll rebuke you if you go wrong. They might chastise you if, if you go wrong. They might discipline you if you go wrong. That's all right. It's better to suffer discipline on earth than to suffer punishment in hellfire. And Sapphira said, that is it. And then Peter said, how is it to have agreed together? To lie unto the Lord. The feet of them that carried your husband, they are coming in. They will carry you as the words dropped from the mouth of Peter. The woman fell down and gave up the ghost. Both of them, husband and wife, because of lying, went to hell the same day. Lord, who shall abide? In thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, walketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. We still have time to come before the Lord and say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, and put the principle in my heart that from this very day, only the truth will come out of this mouth. Give me a good day. Amen. Let's rise up and tell the Lord. The Lord is telling us the importance of telling the truth. The importance of dealing with one another in truth. And the importance of staying, staying by the truth. Living by the truth. Communicating the truth. Speaking the truth one to another. There is nothing to gain with lying. There is nothing to achieve with lying. But to be a Christian... And have Christ the truth, Christ the Lord dwelling inside you and living by that word of truth. And we pray and we take the word of God serious. And the Lord said, Swear not at all. That now for the rest of our lives, as you come to the Lord today, you tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I, here am I. I lay everything upon the altar now. I'm thinking of eternity. I'm thinking of heaven. I want to push all hypocrisy aside. All insincerity aside. All superficiality aside. I want to follow after the Lord. I want to serve the Lord from all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. You confess all the lying. You confess all the deception. You confess all the hypocrisy. You confess all the insincerity. And you confess all the eye service. And say, Lord, I want to follow you now for the rest of my life. Where well, you need to repent, you repent. The words of your mouth. The utterances coming out of you. The communication. The exaggeration. The lying, the deception, the hypocrisy, the insincerity. Everything you confess before the Lord. And then you turn away from all those things. Say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. We don't serve the Lord with lying. We cannot serve the Lord with deception. We serve the Lord with the truth and in the truth. You need salvation for your own sake. You need this holiness, righteousness, truthfulness for your own sake. For the sake of getting to heaven. For the sake of keeping your relationship, fellowship with the Lord. For the sake of escaping the judgment of God. Lying will bring you to judgment. 
Hypocrisy will bring you to judgment. Insincerity, superficiality, nominal Christianity will bring you to judgment. Deception will bring you to judgment. Lying. False swearing will bring you to judgment. But I also come before the Lord saying, Oh Lord, I've heard your word. I want to follow you with all my heart, all my soul. I want to sincerely serve you from now till the rest of my life. That's what brings you to the favor of God. The grace of God is available. And then you say, Oh Lord, you are the truth. Live in me. You are the truth. Abide in me. Lord, for no reason will I tell a lie. What for? What for? You'll be with me. You will guide me. You'll watch over me. You'll watch over my tongue. You'll watch over my life. Oh Lord, here am I. Here am I. I submit, surrender all my life unto you. All my life. All my life. All my life. I surrender unto you. I want to follow you, Lord, in all truthfulness and sincerity. Speaking the truth in your heart, out of your heart, not hiding the truth within and then dealing and trading in lying, transacting a lie. Where a situation is to be made, go ahead and make it. Go ahead and make it. Clear up your conscience. Clean up your conscience. Then you live a free life. A life that is based on the truth. A life that is based on honesty. A life that is based on New Testament salvation. Truthful. Faithful, honest, trustworthy. The grace of God is available. Forgiveness is with the Lord. If you sincerely confess and forsake every shade of lying, every shade of kind of exaggeration, Every shade of falsehood. If you confess it to the Lord and you forsake it and you plead for the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb, He will cleanse you, He will wash you, purge you, purify your conscience, and then you start afresh, start anew. Living by the truth and living on the truth. Not getting involved with anything that will bring line of hypocrisy. Not yielding to the temptation anymore. Covering up the truth. Modifying the truth. Adjusting the truth. To so only what people want to hear. But now you live a truthful life. An honest life. Live the life of Christ. Christ lives in honesty and truthfulness. Anywhere and everywhere with his disciples, with the Heavenly Father, with the women in his ministry, with the men in his ministry, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, well, the sinners, the opposers, the persecutors, never a lie. If we're followers of Christ, we live like he lived. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to live honestly, truthfully. He wants us to live faithfully according to his word. 
you commit yourself to the Lord, no more swearing. In this dispensation at this time, no more swearing. Either by anything, anyone in heaven, swearing by anything, anyone on earth, no more swearing. Truthful all the time. Truthful all the time. Honest all the time. In the market, honest. In the place of work, honest and trustworthy. In the church, in the home, honest and trustworthy. That's the, that's the demand of Christ. That's the essence, the evidence of the Christian life. Honesty and trustworthiness, faithfulness, sincerity, truthfulness, speaking the truth in your heart. Not doing anything in secret that you don't want to see the light of day. Living an hypocritical life, no, that doesn't belong to the Christian. But living honestly, truthfully, faithfully, sincerely. And then the devil cannot accuse you of insincerity. Then the devil cannot accuse you of falsehood, of dishonesty. You want to have a conscience that is clear and clean, void of offense toward God and toward man. Settle the account of the Lord and say, Lord, thank you for revealing the truth to me. I want to live by this truth. Honesty in all things. With your employers, with your employees, honesty. With your landlord, with the tenants, honesty. With business partners, sellers and buyers, honesty. With relatives and neighbors, honesty. With strangers and acquaintances, honesty, truthfulness. That's the real Christianity. If you are saved, that's how to live. Anything different from that means that your salvation will be called into question here on earth and up in heaven. Honesty is a mark of a real Christian. Truthfulness, faithfulness, openness, frankness. Does the mark the evidence of a real Christian experience? The Lord can do it. Settle every account of the Lord and then go out of this place with the choice of character, with the grace of God. That from now on, you will live as a Christian ought to live.